Oh, there it is. And the blue go live button's there and I'm clicking it and we're live. It is Thursday, September 16th, uh, 2021, 5.05 p.m. Eastern time, 4.05 p.m. Yeah, we're now time. That's, it's just an hour. I, I know, I like always forget if it's one or two or if there's some no. weird daylight savings thing. So, um, but uh, we are not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, and this might actually, I think, sound very much in lieu of fun for a lot of people, we're allowed to discuss <laughs> a 150 page long <laughs> antitrust decision in the recent Epic Games versus Apple uh, uh, conversation, or sorry, case that just came down um, last Friday. Yeah. And we have, uh, and we have um, the University of Chicago Law's own Randy Picker here to join us. Welcome back to the show, Randy. Thanks for thanks for coming. Nice to be here. Um, first, before we start, I had a rumor. Do you do you do stand up comedy? Um, wow, what's the right answer to that question? <laughs> so the answer to that question, honestly, is is I mainly do improvisational comedy. Oh. Um, though cool. I have done a little bit of stand-up. Um, oh. So they're, they're very different activities, it turns out. They are. Well, we think of you this can, as- you can, you can find me on YouTube if you're so inclined. Oh, well, awesome. Wow. That's very wow. cool. I, as a respect. <laughs> you know, that's you know that is. honestly, uh, man, I, if, if you get me to talk about it, I'll sound like I've joined a cult. Um, but I'm a huge fan. I think it's good, good, good for the fun, but it's also good for the soul. Good for you as a human being. I told Scott that this show, like when I, we started this show, I think he was surprised by it, but I was like, when he joined and like what Ben and I were doing and he saw like how literally we had almost done, like, I mean, I, when I have to do intellectual prep work for, for a lot of people, I just am like, have no time and there's never going to be any way. And I'm like, no, this is improv. And then your entire, your entire, the thing is you always say yes. That is like one of the rules of improv is like, you just, and it does change. It changes your whole mentality. I think yeah. that, yeah. I mean, Sec Second City has tried to turn that into a very big brand and mainly successfully. So I'm happy to chat about that at some point, but not today. Yeah, totally. Um, so you want to give us kind of the TLDR on, um, on kind of <laughs> yeah. not, not necessarily the decision, but kind of the background going into the decision and where things stood. Yeah, I'd love to do that. So, and, and for me, when I talk about this, I, I want to go back to what I think of as the beginning. Uh, and the beginning is January of 2007 when Apple releases the iPhone. Um, and if if you haven't watched Steve Jobs do that presentation, I don't want to say stop and you know get out of this and go watch, but watch after this. Um, and the critical thing for today's discussion there is, is how locked down the iPhone is. There are 15 icons on the screen. That's all you get. There's no place to get something else. Apple has chosen which ones to put there. Um, and there's no, there's no other way to add functionality. There's a genuine browser, so you can go surf the net as it were, uh, but you can't, you can't add games or anything. And so um, uh, and there was obviously a choice. Uh, and Apple evolved away from that. And they evolved away from that in two stages. So stage one was that they said, well, we're going to let you play games and stuff through the browser. So web 2.0 and things like that. Um, uh, we're not going to curate. We're not going to charge. It's going to be the Wild West. Um, and developers said, no, we need different functionality. We need functionality that gives us better access to the device, just like we would with a computer. And eventually Apple says, okay, we'll do that. We're a little concerned about malware. Uh, and malware turns out to be an important part of the story and how the decision came out. Uh, but Apple says, okay, we'll do that. Uh, and they roll out what we think of as an SDK, a software development kit. Here are a series of tools that you developers can use to access the device. Um, and here's an app store. Um, and Steve Jobs, this is in March of 2008, uh, Jobs says, you know, most places, they're charging 50% for distribution. We're going to give you a break. We're going to charge 30. Um, um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and so they roll out the App Store in July of 2008. And obviously that, is, that is so fascinating. It's just to, that, that, one, that one thing, because that's, the 30 number becomes like really important, right? 
30 number is huge. And it turns out that that number, which, you know, you read Judge Gun, uh, Rogers' decision, she says that they sort of pulled it out of the air. You know, if you're running, if you're Microsoft running Xbox, they charge 30. If you're PlayStation, they charge 30. So 30 is this sort of, tell, you know, this number that's out there. You know, I'm an economist. Um, I have my numbers to come from places. This one doesn't obviously come from anywhere. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's the big picture on the phone. Then we'll jump forward. So if you jump forward, obviously, the App Store becomes this enormous um, uh, profit engine for Apple, um, this platform, obviously, for distributing these games. Um, I, I think it's important, that, really important, and I'll go back now to 2007, when Apple releases the iPhone, uh, Steve Jobs says, our goal is to get 1% of the phone market. That's our goal. That would be a huge success for us. So they're starting from nothing. There are dominant players in place. Nokia has this operating system called Symbian, Research in Motion slash BlackBerry. So there are these dominant players in place. And so displacement of those players is pretty remarkable. But the iPhone's revolutionary. Google buys Android, goes down that path. Microsoft plays Microsoft. They say, we've got software. Um, we'll distribute it the way we did on the PC. That strategy loses. And we end up with the successful duopoly of Apple and Google. Okay. Um, Epic, um, you know, you know who Epic is. Um, I, I really don't know who Epic is. I have watched people play Fortnite. I've not played Fortnite. Any Fortnite players here? Yes. Really? I, I, I play Fortnite. Yeah. What? I'm sorry. Tell us about that. What's it like to play Fortnite? Oh, it's it's a it's a game where you get dropped onto an island and you have to shoot people or be shot. Um, and there, there, you know, it's, um, there, there's also um, a cloud and a storm coming at you. So there's like time, there's a time pressure. Um, but then like when you, 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 you can do other things like buy like different costumes and things like that, you yes. can customize it, so. Okay. So, so, so exactly. That was good. So Fortnite's a freemium game. You can play for free, but they've built up this whole world of stuff you can buy. You know, I gather you can buy these elaborate dances. That's what I'm doing there. Uh, victory dances. When you play your <laughs> and the like. um, there was no dancing when I played Space Invaders. Okay. Um, well, I so, love Space um, Invaders. <laughs> Space Invaders. Uh, a long time ago. Um, so, so, and, and so uh, Fortnite is not happy with the fact that for all of these in-app purchases that Scott and I were just talking about, Apple's getting a 30% cut on that. Um, and Fortnite, um, and, and, and what Fortnite does here, you, you know, you step back and go, whoa. So uh, the opinion describes this as Project Liberty. Um, and Project Liberty was intended to free Fortnite from the Apple tyranny. Um, and so and they release software updates through Apple uh, they effectively hide within an update what they call a hot fix. And the hot fix lets them flick a switch. And all of a sudden, inside the app, they're selling in competition with Apple. Do the same thing on Google Play. At the same time, they, they have this, this, this video that they put on YouTube, which is a takeoff on Apple's famous 1984 ad they ran for the Super Bowl. So it's a great play on that. So I, I admire so much the the audacity of the public relations campaign. And oh, by the way, uh, we have Crevasseline and more ready to file lawsuits against Apple and Google. So all of it happens basically on the same day. Um, and that gets us- I didn't realize that was all like, they just like, they did that in such a coordinated way. All complete, and there's more, right? They've got a, 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 a group that they've organized to defend apps. So no, very clever. This is a very big, sophisticated company. They're not worth two and a half trillion dollars. They're only worth twenty-seven billion dollars, but they're a big, sophisticated company. They're the little guy. Sorry, I'm just. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they're the little guy in this story. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're, they're not even worth as much as like Warren Buffett or something, or well, yeah, exactly. that, that's, that's our standard. <laughs> if, if you're not worth Warren Buffett, we're not interested. <laughs> By the way. 
By the way, can I just tell you something? I, I just as a like editorial comment, you make antitrust sound really interesting. Oh, Doesn't he? I love it. Really. <laughs> We're going to talk about railroads in the 1890s in Monday in my class. It's killer. What? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so we get this lawsuit, and Kate, you said Friday, late Friday afternoon. This yeah, it was late Friday. Page decision came out, single space, um, and and that's where we are. So I don't know where you want to go next, but that's the background. Yeah, I guess like I mostly want to talk about kind of the battles over the line drawing about how they were deciding to measure this market, like how they managed to, I think this is fascinating, right? Because from my understanding, and I don't know if this is just where they eventually got or this is where they started, Epic started with kind of this really kind of, I think, of course they did. Like, I guess you always, I guess the probably like the thing that you always do is go as big as you possibly can. Yeah. Right. And then like the, uh, and then of course I think, well, I don't know in the, it, you know, and the other way, if you're um, the other guy. Yeah. So they went really big and said video game market, like the video game market, like that was like, or like that, like the, basically the application based video game market on mobile phones or something to that extent was the market that Apple was dominating. Yeah, and so, are the transactions for? Yeah, so so obviously there's a, you know, all of this occurs within a body of case law, um, and the leading decision, which clearly influences how uh, Judge Rogers sees this situation, is the American Express case. So American Express came out, uh, Supreme Court case, 2018. Um, Very and, controversial. And, well, that's what I was just going to say. So thank you. So. Certainly, if you hang out with the right people, very controversial. Um, you know, it dep depends on who you are, um, but but controversial is fair. Um, and and what was interesting about what's interesting about that case is is maybe you could just state what the case was. Yeah, sure. It's yeah. A, it's yeah. a little yeah. it's like it's a little complicated, but it's not that complicated. Like, it's basically the tell me if I'm wrong here. It's basically a suit against Amex for transactions. Right. And like it's about defining a two sided what they call the two sided platform and whether like if I'm taking your money, Scott, and I'm Amex and then I'm giving your money to the other person, I'm taking a cut. Which side of that transaction do you measure the dominance? Okay. On? Just, yeah, do you so, see what I'm saying? And so like, yeah. do you have to do both or do you just do it on one or just do it on the other? Is that kind of right? Am I getting it kind of yeah, right? You're in the right zone. I'm going to break okay. it down just a little bit. Sure. I, I need to get my Amex card. I'm not going to put it up so you can see the number. Yeah, please but, don't do but, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but, I, 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 but what happens is the case is about this point. I, I go to I go to present my Amex card to complete a transaction. And at the point I do it, can the merchant say, you know, we pay American Express more at that point to complete the transaction than we pay Visa. Could you give me a Visa? And mm -hmm. Amex has what's called, and this does play in this case actually, an anti-steering provision. Yeah. You agree to take the Amex card. You can't mm -hmm. at the point of sale say, could you give me a different card? That's that's what that case is about. And, uh, and, and the legal dispute then is the United States sues Trump administration, you know, drops out. So it's Ohio versus American Express, but that's a detail. Um, the, the legal issue in that case is, is whether or not it's an antitrust violation to restrict competition like that at the point of sale. And as Kate was saying, what makes that case sort of interesting is, is that the Supreme Court embraces this two-sided markets framing and sort of says, and two-sided market um, in that situation, just to get it right, you've got um, you've got the Amex as sort of the platform, and you've got merchants. Do they take mm. the card or not? Yeah. On the facts of the case, for example, something like nine million places take Visa, and only six million places take Amex. So three, three million people say Amex you're too pricey for me. I don't take it. Those were the facts, at least at the time of the case. Um, so you've got the merchants, some who take Sorry, Amex, right. some who don't. And then yeah. you've got customers, right? And, and customers say, should, is it, should I put a space in my wallet on this card? Um, and so you've, that's the nature of that, where consumers want there to be a lot of customers who take it. If no one takes it, why should I take the card? Why should I have the card? And cons uh, merchants are saying, well, look, you've got to show me your customers or why else should I bother with your card? So that's what makes it a two-sided market. And the Supreme Court sort of, in a Thomas opinion, 
sort of goes whole hog and said, yeah, we should do it. So that's modern anti, that's modern economics, modern microeconomics. That's what we should do. Um, and so they embrace this two-sided markets framing. And they well, I'm sorry, when do you mean that's what we should do? I'm sorry, just be, what well, do you mean that's that, what... Yeah, sure, that was, that was quick. So um, the leading, they effectively say the leading way to understand these situations is through this two-sided markets framing. That's the best way mm -hmm. to understand. Um, that's, you know, and, and the revolution, the Chicago revolution, if you like, I don't necessarily like, but, but that's what the market would say. The Chicago revolution and antitrust has been the incorporation of economics into antitrust analysis. Okay. And so the Thomas opinion says, oh, we did that in the old days with ordinary price theory, and microeconomics. Now two-sided analysis is the next like 2.0 version of that. All right. Okay. I gotcha. Okay. So, so that's what we're going to do here. And consequentially, what that means is, and, and is that the plaintiff in this case, in alleging a violation, has to pay attention to the consequences of the practice for both sides of the market. You can't just gotcha. say merchants are paying more. Well, maybe that's to fund what's happening on the consumer side. Right. So that makes it a lot harder for people to bring cases. Yep. I see. I got gotcha. you. Okay. okay. Thank you. That the thing really that helpful. I just don't love about this, just, and I wonder, I wanted just to know if I'm just overthinking it. It just seems to me like almost like an infinite number of platforms that you can start placing and play in any one of these types of exchanges in a way. Like, why are you counting the merchant? Like, why, like, like they call it like a one sided transaction, like a one sided platform to like yeah. go between, but to go to pay your money to to the merchant like for example like if you're going to buy like a bunch of bananas but like if you buy it with a credit card now it's a two side like is that still a one-sided platform or is that a multi-sided platform or are you like in this giant kind of triangle of like like and then there's like i don't know so one of the things i've been reading is like multi-sided platforms and i'm like isn't they aren't they all like multi-sided platforms if you just go big enough i'm sorry this is why so 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 uh, yeah. justice thomas tries to shrink the field a little. So, so, so he says, um, you know, what's distinctive about this situation is, is that we should focus on the transactions and that will get us back to Apple versus Epic here in just a second. And the fact that the transaction is the thing that matters here and that's happening both for the merchant and the consumer simultane simultaneously. So he says, I don't know about what other cases are. I won't deal with those. But in these simultaneity situations, that's the core of the Amex decision. And so, and, and so the ultimate definition of market that Judge Rogers applies here is the mobile gaming transaction market. So she is, that was how I got us here. So she is squarely within the Amex framework in how she uh. defines the market here. Yeah, I actually thought it was kind of eloquent or eloquent, elegant. Like I thought, mm -hmm. I, like of the two, of the two, I didn't agree with either. And well, I was she, like, exactly. I, she said, you're wrong, you're wrong. Here's what it is. Yep, exactly. And I kind of, I was like, yeah, it's kind of is what it is. Uh, That's but what she did. yeah, did you, do you agree with that? Like on the facts? Well, so, so now I'm going to say a word that I regard as a dangerous word. Uh, but, um, and that word is sub market. Uh, and so, and so, whoa, whoa, yeah. Randy. Uh, okay, close. Your <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll try not to use the S, the S word again. Say the F word all the, the time, word. but this is like you're not allowed to. No, yeah. <laughs> so, so we, we, we have rules here. This is in the free for all. <laughs> sub market. Then I go, well, yes, yeah, that has to you're be. Right, it's so, a sub market, no. okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so is it a market? I don't know, but it's a sub market, right? It's a so, sub market. Okay. And, and to be fair to her, I mean, you know, the Supreme Court case law talks about sub markets, so she's completely comfortably within that framework. And on that sense, whether there's a bigger market or not, I, I I think she's right that there's a meaningful sub market here. Part of that has to do with, and she talks through this. 180 pages, single spaced in, in detail. It's, it's, you know, the difference in, in how people play games, that the kinds of things and the circumstances under which you play games on an Xbox or a PlayStation is different than what you're doing on the iPhone. And so this, the, I, I think she's almost certainly right that those are meaningfully separated. And so Apple's effort to define the larger video gaming market, you know, Again, what's the market? Well, some market, I don't know, but but those are those you can easily see why one might think of those as meaningfully distinct 
entertainment spaces. Yeah. So I, I think she's in a comfortable spot there, really. So I'm seeing that even though hmm. there is some, so basically, okay, so actually who kind of comes out? So now that this is the market, who comes yeah. out? Like who wins? And I'm seeing both sides contemplating appeal. So I think that that should <laughs> tip a <Well>. little bit. <laughs> Epic has filed an appeal. Apple has yeah. not yet. So, um, so, so look, what I, what I want to say there is, is that, you know, and let's just cut to the chase here a little bit. So we don't lose, we keep track of what happens here. I think there are 10 counts in the original complaint, at least as she writes the opinion. Apple wins nine of those and loses one. So all of the traditional antitrust counts, Apple wins. So, so, and part of that has to do with, it really is driven by two things. So we may as well make sure we all see all that. Um, one is she says, she, she has a market. So now she can calculate market shares and she does a little math there. And she says, well, Apple's market share in that market is, depending on the year, maybe 57%. And she says, I've looked at a bunch of cases and the cases say, you know, if you're below this number, you're not a monopolist. Um, and if you're above this number, you are a monopolist. Apple's below the number that it would take to be a monopolist. And so the section two claims, which focus on monopoly, those just like go away. So, so Apple that, kicks them to the curb. Go ahead. That strikes, that strikes me as airtight reasoning. Okay. So those get kicked to the curb. And then she, then she comes back to the section one and section one requires a, a, a concerted action. She's very skeptical that the unilaterally imposed contracts by Apple suffice for that. But even if they did, and this is, I think, important, she says what Apple says about security, I believe. There's a pro-competitive justification for the business model. And, and if you ask what Epic really wants here, they want two things, I think. They would like to be able to offer their own store on yeah. Apple, on iOS, um, and Apple says, no, you can't do that. Um, and uh, they would like something other than a 30% fee. <laughs> so a uh, much lower fee. Um, so, And that's the, st just to be clear, that wasn't like, these are not, that 30% fee again is not negotiated. Epic didn't negotiate that with Apple. That is the standard fee for all, all developers on the app. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there are wrinkles to that as I right, understand it, but, yeah. but yes, okay. <laughs> Well, but, just like it depends on whether you're the, the commercial nature of your application. Okay. So, but, but as a general matter, yes, absolutely not negotiated, just fixed. And so, um, and so, and so, and she says, uh, and I wrote a piece recently talking about, you know, secure app stores and security competition, a short piece, an online piece. Um, and, and she cites exactly the same study that I saw there, which is a Nokia study. And the Nokia study says, it, it's just amazing how directly it, 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 it addresses what, what Apple wants is. It says that there are meaningful malware differences between the Android and iOS ecosystem. And that is really driven by the fact that on Android, you can install alternative app stores. So there, that's a much more open platform and the Nokia report, which I don't, you know, I just stumbled into it. I don't have any reason to think it's not legit. I mean, um, says that it that there are important malware differences. So Apple says, we offer security to our customers. And that is something which differentiates us from our chief competitor, Android. And Rogers buys that completely. So there's a pro-competitive justification for what Apple is doing and not opening up to other app stores. It doesn't justify the 30%. We'll get to that in a sec, but yes. Wait, wait, wait. So, so the basic the basic idea as I understand it is that this is this is not a rent. This is a, a charging for service, right? Well, so, it, so, so that's, I mean, there is a question here. So let's just make sure we see exactly how Apple rub it. So it's really subtle. Um, so Apple insists that if you are a developer doing freemium games, um, so Fortnite, I gather, you get it for free, and then you buy V-Bucks in the app to buy these skins and dances and the like. That's the setup. Um, and Apple's getting a cut of those V-Bucks. Um, and... Um, uh, uh, Do they have the Macarena? 
I, I uh, <laughs> remember the Macarena. Um, uh, I probably, in a younger period, did the Macarena. Um, I can't swear to that, but uh, okay. certainly. We'll see, we'll see, if, we'll see if it's in the thing. Someone who plays Fortnite um, can tell us who's not Scott. That will not be on YouTube. Um, <laughs> no. uh, yeah, so, 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 you know, look, Apple, Apple, um, the 30% is not tied to anything in particular, but the way they collect it and the way they can see how much they should collect is they insist that these purchases occur through their in-app payment system. Now, that system, they actually don't do the payment processing. That's what the opinion is so clear on, and that came out in the trial. They actually pay Visa to do that. So Apple's not trying to take over. The, yes, yes. They're not trying After, to take over. Really? Interesting. I said, really? That's inter I didn't know that piece. Yes. They're not trying to somehow take over or monopolize this adjacent market. They don't care about that market. It is just a mechanism for counting how much people are paying the epics of the world and collecting their 30%. And that's what she says. So it's not at all clear that this 30% commission would go away if all of a sudden you told Epic that they could use an alternative app processor, payment processor, right? It would be harder for Apple to collect it, right? The because they wouldn't have their counters in there. It all would be of Epic that, right? counters. So, yeah. so how, how, do you, how do you audit? How do you know, right? So the system they've designed is one that makes that possible. But this was Scott's point. They are charging for the platform. They're charging for all the patents associated with it and all the other services they provide, right? But And the, and the other services that they provide are not insubstantial. Exactly but, so. Right. Agreed. I mean, so, right. I mean, the thing about, um, you, you said like that there was a difference in terms of Google malware versus iOS yes. malware. <laughs> like saying, like, there's like a difference between like gun violence here versus Kabul. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it, 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 I mean, I, uh, Google, the Google Play ecosystem is, is, is not great. And I, I stay away from it. Um, uh, and uh, iOS is, you know, really, really good. Um, you can download, I mean, they play a lot. And they do pay a lot of developers to review everything until it, I mean, oh, yeah. that's like, yeah. This is, yeah, this is not, I mean, this is, so that's why I said they're claiming it's not a rent, it's a service. I mean, like, there is just a bit of a rent, obviously, because, like, um, they're paying for the platform, you're paying for the platform and stuff. But they really are doing a real substantial um, service. Um, the only problem is, of course, is that there's no justification for why they pick 30. Exactly. And, and 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 the opinion's crystal clear on that. It's not a cost-based measure. It's it's not tied to anything. Again, I, did any of the, I'm like I don't want to spoil the surprise, but did like was there just like a moment that they did discovery and figured out that there was just some like some like associate sitting in their office in crevasse and they just like picked thirty because it was their birthday or something, and that was how old they were turning. I don't think so, but but I mean, look, I mean that that number because like Apple produces reports. You look across many many stores and you see it. Indeed, somewhat embarrassingly, I would have thought, but maybe not. Epic runs its own store, um, and at some point they were charging thirty percent. See, that's that's really embarrassing. Like now, now you, they've cut it. They've cut yeah. it. So now they're only charging twelve percent. But Roger says they're losing money on that at this point. They need to be charging more. She thinks it's a loss leader at this point. But she says twelve not covering it. So where does this thirty percent come from? You you acted before like you knew. No, like no, no, the, no, I don't. Oh, no, oh, you I, were, no, oh, you I were, thought, really, oh, you were, oh, you really don't know. No, I, okay. No, I thought it was the opposite. I thought you knew. I thought the claim was is that it was what Steve Jobs said was the competitive advantage, uh, like the price cut um, no, that Apple said, gave you, which is thirty per, instead of fifty percent is thirty percent. So yeah. he says he says at the beginning, in the very beginning, he says, "Oh, if you look at how much um, retailers take, it's like fifty percent." But I, I do think that the 30% figure tracked what was going on in the console, game console industry. Now, mm. that's, you know, that industry, if you know anything about that industry, when Microsoft releases the Xbox, they're losing supposedly $100 to $150 per Xbox. They are selling the Xbox at a loss 
and they make money on the games, and so they have to they have to control that yeah. game. So they ch they charge developers these royalties to compensate. That's pretty typical, though. With yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, but yes, absolutely. Apple is not losing money on iPhones. Right. <laughs> Quite right. Yeah. Right. Yes. So yes. so that thirty percent figure, which maybe makes more sense in a framework where the device is being cross subsidized. That's not the cross subsidy that's taking place here. So what is the one thing that Epic won on? And are they appealing basically on the other nine kind of run of the mill, like antitrust yeah. things that they got like shooed away about? Yes. Yeah, so good. So let's do that. So, so as I said, they went one for 10. Um, and so, um, and I, now we get to a body of law I know less about. So um, there's a California. Uh, 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 Randy, I'll help you out. Oh, okay. <laughs> we get to California unfair okay. competition law, I guess is what it is. Um, and she focuses there on two things. Apple has an anti-steering clause. So that discussion we had about Amex before, that was not just frolic and detour. So Apple has an anti-steering clause, um, which says you can't, you can't tell people in the app that they could buy somewhere outside cheaper. And she kills that off. She issues ultimately an injunction. That's what she issues. It's one page injunction. Um, and so she kills that off. Um, uh, and then she also says, oh, Apple, you're not letting them email their customers. Um, and that limits competition. So she kills that off. And all of that she sees as unfair competition under applicable California state law. So that's the that's the oh, so win. That's, so like it's just the it's just the state claim under California. Wow. Okay. Yes. Wow. And, and that and that. So we're, just to be clear, again, there were California, as it were, antitrust claims, and those got killed off too. Right. Right. Are those how duplicative of those are of a federal? Like, are they pretty They're close? Usually, pre usually pretty, pretty close. duplicative. Yeah. Yeah, like bringing state constitutional claims alongside, like, I mean, well, actually, California yes. is a little different on the First Amendment, so I don't want to say that. But the, in most places, it's, they're very, they're very closely tied. That's okay. So, so Epic now files, so they're appealing, I mean, I guess maybe all of it except, except the I, state I claims. They're not appealing the part they won, but I assume they're going to appeal. And those briefs, I, I, not that we care about that, but I, you know, I'm teaching it, I trust starting Monday. Um, I, I think Epic's brief is due at, you know, late mid December. So, um, uh, Ninth Circuit, um, uh, that matters in the sense that um, a, a, an important tech antitrust decision there is the Qualcomm case. Mm. Uh, the Qualcomm case, I think, is seen as pretty defendant friendly. Um, so, um, Epic will have to deal with that. Now, Epic's represented by Kravath, Swain, and Bohr. Um, they are, you know, high-end attorneys uh, in the old yeah. days. They defended, Never heard of them. Defended IBM huh. and the antitrust. Yeah, I didn't get an offer from them. I just want to, uh, like, <laughs> in, 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 in a day where for some reason I've bring, been bringing up half so employment offers. I will do yeah. you one better, Scott, which is that like I was I was um, my OCI, like my on campus interview when I was in law school was in 2010. And it was the year after all of the like the, the complete decimation of the law and like Cravath didn't even come to Georgetown. They didn't even like, they didn't even show up. Not just, it wasn't, I didn't take it personally because it was like everyone, you know? So right. when, <laughs> but, I, when I, I was doing interviewing for second year jobs um, after the summer, after my second year, I went 23 for 24 on callbacks. But which one do I remember? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But but I actually, I, my, my, uh, uh, my flame out at Crevasse, Swain and Moore is like one of my most tweeted, retweeted really? threads. Uh, yeah, of oh, wow. like, like uh, that. That was like an epic screw up of colossal proportion, which I don't, I don't want to use up valuable time telling. But I, oh, I that hear was, that if we have time to the end. Yeah, I don't think okay. I've read that. Okay. Okay. So like, a, it's a ninety second story, but it's like it's one of the. Oh, tell us great, Just go ahead. Yeah, let's hear it. Oh, okay. Hear so. It. So I go, I go to, uh, so like I had gotten a lot of offers, but like, cause like it was like in the 1980s and like everyone, uh, the law firms had a lot of money. So, so I, I was getting a lot of offers where right? so I go to Carras, Swain and Moore and like, you have like interview, uh, like you go to a, you know, um, 
a different partner and then associates and, and everyone was going great except for my last one. I walk in and there was this guy, I don't know if you remember, his name is Robert McCrate. And Robert oh, yeah, McCrate, the he, report. Well, right, the McCrate report, of course. And yeah. he had like he had like the corner office. Okay. And I walk in and it's all windows and it's overlooking Brooklyn. And it's really dramatic. I say, wow, that's really dramatic. He said, yes, it's it's very significant for me. So he said he puts a point to a bridge over there and he said, You see that bridge there? That was the bridge that when I was a summer, uh, when I was a junior um, associate, we um, we uh, litigated that and we won that case. And you see that over there? That's where my grandfather or whatever, great grandfather was a federal district judge. And you see that over there? That building, we're under, that's under litigation right now. And I think we're going to get that injunction and everything like that. And I, so I pointed out, I said, you see that building over there? He goes, yeah, I guess. He goes, I once had pizza there. <laughs> and like, does not laugh at all. Does not laugh at all. And I'm like, I think it's a good line. So, but, and then he says to me, he says to me, I hardly think that's as significant as what I point out. And I said, you didn't have that pizza. <laughs> Yeah, and, I've told you this story before. This is really good, though. It was yeah, really worth telling swear you. to God, swear to God, it happened. I did not get the offer from Cravath Swain. Yeah, anymore. no but, kidding. Look, look at this so story. Screw you, Cravath. Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. That 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 might I might have taken us off topic. <laughs> okay. I I love that. I so I want to well, I want to ask a kind of slightly different question. Cause what I have been like in the fallout of this case, like, right. Like you have like antitrust is all over the place these days. Yeah. It has become incredibly politicized. Yeah. There is the old antitrust, which is the established law that like things like Epic and, and um, Epic be, be Apple are being like kind of litigated under. Um, yeah. And then there's kind of, which is the Chicago or like, like old school, yeah, like antitrust. Right. And now there's like the new school antitrust, the Neobrin Dicean antitrust, yeah. that is this movement towards having a more holistic judge uh, or a more holistic concept of, of counting and measuring market power, markets, all for the sake of like what really counts as consumer welfare, um, yeah. so to speak, right? Um, all of the people that I follow, they're I don't actually follow them because they annoy me sometimes, but they, um, but those people that uh, were like very upset about this decision and thought that it was an example of why all of this, like all this stuff needs to change. Like this is, I got a lot of, this is just this borky and garbage with a m definition of the market means nothing. This is just where you draw the line and we're drawing it around these old white guy lines and like whatever else. I don't want to bring race into it necessarily, yeah. but I, you know, but you get like my, you get my general ideas. Like this is like antiquated and not really a accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish. We have narrowed it to the point of uselessness. What what say you? What what well, say so, this? Uh, what say this judge? What say anyone who wants to use this case in the future? Yeah, so, so I guess I'd say a couple things. I mean, I uh, look. I mentioned earlier that Epic is worth twenty eight billion dollars. Uh, this is a fight among the very rich. So so why this is the case one would get exercised about if one you know had these proclivities? I I, I don't know. Um, uh, right. You know, and and I you know. The, the people who are going to benefit from this, if they are, it's not clear, again, uh, Apple can maybe continue to charge the 30%, are they've got, they've got this small developer program now. So the, the number of people who really have a lot of money at stake here is a small number. Okay, but, right, look, my I went to law school with Amy Klobuchar. We were in law review together. Um, you know, she's got draft legislation that would address app stores. Um, you know, she wants to mandate uh, that there be app store competition on these devices. Um, and so I, you know, I think, I, I, I think the tools here are, we need to make some choices and, and Amy, you know, Senator Klobuchar has put forward a choice. Uh, you know, what I think you see here is, is, is that, and this is what Scott said, <laughs> that, that Apple's actually brought a lot of value to the table yeah. and that, and that, 
you know, forcing us all into the Android model. This is what I said in this piece that I wrote recently. I, I, I don't understand why that's actually good for consumers. I don't even understand the politics of it, honestly. I don't understand why she thinks that people who live on these devices want them to be screwed up. So I, I really don't get that. Um, you know, if you want to say monopoly is bad and that we ought to do something about that, and, and there's, you know, five or six pending bills in the House in addition to Senator Klobuchar's, she's got two or three bills in the Senate. That's fine. Let's have that discussion. I've written some stuff about that. Um, and, you know, I, 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 in the original set of hearings on all this, they asked for expert, you know, reports and I filed one such report. I mean, there's a robust discussion to be had here, and and, and that's great. I, I will say, um, you know, in 1996, Apple was a dying company. Um, so you know, I, I, I remember that so well. Do you remember their comeback through their marketing campaign of Make the Switch? Do you remember this? I don't remember that. So, so oh no, it's like every like people giving testimonials about switching to Mac, and like they would hold up like their like iMac and they'd be like, okay, maybe that was just me. But yeah, anyways, that's why yeah, I, I yeah, literally- yeah, It's a success. It's yeah. obviously really the iPod, which changes the trajectory of the company. And then that feeds, of course, into the iPhone. So, um, uh, and of course, in 1996, at the end of 1996, they bought Next and brought back yeah. Steve Jobs. Scott, you want to say yeah. something? Uh, yeah, I was just to say, uh, like, God forbid we should talk about this because no good ever comes from it. Um, but but um, I'm really I hate to say this. It's but it's not. I'm not going to say submarket. Don't worry. But, it's not um, the S word. So I knew you were. <laughs> no, 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 it's not the S word. Yeah. But like my understanding is that the EU is breathing down the app stores' necks, right? Like, what's the deal with the EU? Yeah. Um, so that's fine. So so multiple things there. So so the EU has a number of traditional antitrust investigations going on. Uh, we'll see what those do. I'm, what I'm going to say is if their track record is um, uh, tells us anything about the future, the answer is nothing. And what I mean by that is, is um, if you look at what they did in the Microsoft cases, they took a number of actions there. They got lots of big checks. I think they accomplished nothing with regard to competition. That's true, I think, on Google as well. So if you, you know, if you go to stat counter and look at Google's market share in Europe versus Google's market share in the, in the United States, it's a flat 90% for them. Okay, but, but where the Europe is going to matter is, um, is they are clearly farther down the legislative path than we are. They have a draft piece of legislation called the Digital Markets Act, the DMA. Um, and the DMA uh, will move much more towards a, you know, public you still public utility style regulatory framework for these industries wow you know uh, try a version of that i taught it in my tech policy seminar um in the in the winter um they would have forced effectively forced google kate mentioned in the you know when we were talking at and t the the digital markets act would effectively force google to become a wholesaler of all of their data i say a wholesaler it's not clear they're going to get paid if they get paid a wholesaler but to force them to share all of the data they have in a variety of ways. So, so the DMA's got a variety of provisions like that. Uh, my assumption is, is some version of that will get through. Indeed, you know, Germany passed a version of this a couple of years ago now at this point, at least a year ago. And, you know, they've got pending investigations of any number of these companies. And those may or may not, I don't know. We, I don't think we've seen that play out. Those may make a difference. So, so Europe is, and you know, they are, they're, they're more willing to try than we are, and they have been. Though so obviously, you know, the new Washington, who knows what's gonna happen. We should maybe have Daphne Keller on to talk about um, the DMA. She's been, she's just like, she does an incredible job keeping up with every, I mean, she's, I mean, obviously just such a skilled attorney and, but yeah, she'd be great. Um, if you haven't had Daphne on, you should absolutely have her on. Oh yeah. I. She's been on, but like, uh, I, I guess I like talk to her like every day basically. And so I, I'm like, oh, I just like, don't even think to like bother her to like, yeah. like, but, um, but yeah, no, we should definitely come on. She's just brilliant. Um, absolutely wonderful. Uh, mostly I've been working with her with DSA stuff, not yes, the DMA. Exactly. So that's, like that's that, like, but yeah. she's also been doing the DMA stuff because it kind of overlaps right. with like the intellectual property and innovation, like overlap with antitrust. Um, Dr. Doom, we have time for two questions. Dr. Doom and Richard, Dr. Doom, 
the you are a voice in the in the ether. Please speak to us. Sure. Um, another question, which is related, uh, uh, occurred to me, which is that there is an ancient history sort of analogy. Microsoft was running the, what they used to call butterfly markets, two sided markets with getting developers on one side and the customers on the other side. And they talked about um, having a, a tax. It was internally discussed as the Microsoft tax, which seems very similar to this. And there was litigation specifically over certain things that could pass through their, their, their choke point. Uh, for instance, Google Chrome. And in fact, there was, they were forced that that market was forced to actually allow distribution. Now, of course, the price was zero, but why isn't this analogous to the app stuff? And related to that, you talked about certification. Well, in the real world, there are certification companies in, conflict, uh, in competition with each other, like ETL and, and Underwriters uh, Laboratory. Why in the world? Isn't this open so that there are different certifiers and people can make a decision? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Thanks, Good. Dr. Doom. Good. So, so, so I think the Microsoft comparison. I, I, I think that's exactly right. If we've got the right era, so um, though I'm not sure which way it goes. So, so the United States cases against Microsoft, we tend to think of the browser case, um, which was brought in May of '98. That's the one that eventually uh, results in the 7-0 decision in 2001 in the DC circuit. Uh, but there was a prior case uh, and the prior case related to uh, MS-DOS licensing. Um, and Microsoft was running exactly the kind of tax system there that Dr. Doom is talking about. Uh, and that tax system was, was that Microsoft said it had two types of licenses. I'm gonna focus on the per processor license. And under the per processor license, Microsoft said to, uh, computer maker, I'll say a name, who knows how many of you have heard of, I'll say K-Pro, right? Um, yeah, K-Pro, who knows, we'll see if your reader, your listenership knows K-Pro or not, but they were an early uh, portable maker. K Microsoft says- Luggable. Luggable, exactly, perfect, luggable, yeah. Um, so Microsoft says to them, uh, every time you sell a computer, whether you put DOS on it or not, you have to write us a check. That was what the per processor licensing said. Um, and the government challenged that and there was a, ultimately a settlement. What Microsoft would say in defense of that practice, certainly what I say in the class is, is they say huge amounts of software piracy, it's hard for us to keep track. We need something we can verify and quantify. We wanna get paid on that. And that's exactly what Apple's doing here in the NFP. Mm. So I think there's um, in terms of this verification nice. and quantification, yeah, oh, that's such that's an interesting comparison. Yeah, yeah I'm great. In a drunk dial voicemail sometimes. I use Google Voice to, and I had this thought late at night the other night was after reading it. So I think that's the right comparison there. The Google Chrome point there is interesting. It is completely fair to say I'm writing this book and I, you know, I talk about the emergence of Chrome. There is absolutely no question that the eventual remedy in the Microsoft case freed up competition there and made it easier for Chrome to get distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do think that matters. And obviously Chrome displaces Internet Explorer. On the certification, which was the second point. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right to say that we could figure out how to run competing certification. Apple is still going to want to charge for every all of the, there's a zillion patents associated with uh, the App Store and the like. Um, there's obviously an audience gathering, uh, and and Roger sees all of that. So that you'd have to still build out all of that, even if you allowed for competing certification. Obviously, competing certification gets us back to Daphne to some extent because that's a moderation system. And let's talk about you know how well we think those systems work. But it's possible. No, it is a moderation system, or it could be like you can consider certification a way of doing like a market for rules or like a standardization. Like I think that that's I think that that's I think that that's correct. Um, Richard, I love your question. It's a really good one. I, Go I, ahead. I feel, like, I feel like I'm asking the same question that was just asked, but well, it's in a similar vein. Oh, really? I thought it was a little bit different. Well, it's a little different. Yeah. So I I understand how Apple's concerns about malware inform their decision to limit the purchases of apps to their own store. 
but I, I'm curious really if that's the entire story. And I, you know, I just think about over the years following Apple, um, that, that they, you know, they've also been uh, concerned with the reliability of the platform, you know, going beyond that. Um, and, you know, which is, uh, it's arguably a different issue than malware, although malware isn't a reliability problem. Um, so I, my, I guess my question is, um, why, it, are, why, is the, why can't the consumer be allowed to make this decision about taking these risks? Um, you know, we, we can, I had a friend who jailbroke his iOS device, yeah. let's, you know, yeah. and, uh, um, you know, there was no, there was no problem. But that was a risk that that friend was taking, um, you know, so, uh, so why isn't this, uh, why isn't this something that consumer yeah, has sure. power to do? So, I want to hear Scott on this too. I feel like Scott has thoughts. Wow. Do you want to go first? Oh, no. No, 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 no. Go ahead, Randy. I just meant like, okay. like Scott's no, no, been fine. working on malware no. stuff lately. This is what I want to say, and I'm, I'm not going to get as, I'm trying, it's Alex Stamos, I guess. Alex. Yeah, Alec, thank you. Um, no, no, Alex, it's Alex. Alex, good, that's what yes. I said, okay. So I saw some tweets from him on this, I think. I'll have to go back and check, but here's the idea. It's, it's a pretty simple idea. He says, sophisticated users want choice, right? They can manage choice. The problem with, with phishing and social engineering attacks, and that's what she talks about, Rogers talks about in the opinion, is how you run that sophisticated user system simultaneously with all these unsophisticated users. I told the, I told Alex, by the way, that this argument, this tweet stream was that he was like, I was like, this is like the Madisonian like like explanation for like malware protection. Like, it, no, it, it really is. It's like you need an elite to like do some things. You just do. Like so, 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 so the so the problem is, you know, how you make both of those run in the same, you know, give give to the sophisticated and somehow protect the less sophisticated. And so, and and that's what and, and Rogers obviously buys that idea, Judge Rogers. Um, and so, so I think that's it. I mean, you know, and and I, man, I think I'm reasonably sophisticated. I still think I click once too often occasionally on something I shouldn't click on. Right. I mean, you know, and, and I'm, I did yeah. Did, did you see the new, did, did you see this? I was going to ask you about this, Scott. Did you see the new, uh, I guess like virus that has like, does not involve clicking anything that like in like, oh, yeah, yeah. So this is the Pegasus and yes, the Pegasus. Yeah, yeah. What happened with right. that? Oh, well, that, that, I mean, that's, um, so, um, there's an Israeli cyber oh, yeah. weapons, <laughs> firm that manufactures and deploy, uh, uh, well, they sell, let's just say, they sell cyber weapons, cyber exploits to whoever <laughs> will pay for them. Um, and they have sold spyware, especially particularly virulent, uh, difficult um, uh, to detect kind of spyware called Pegasus. And they're, um, uh, this this spyware has ended up on many people's uh, on human rights activists, on journalists, um, uh, um, cell phones, um, and um, Citizen Lab out of Toronto um, has been reporting on this. And it turns out that no, like for Pegasus, you normally have to like they would you'd have to click on a link, um, even though the you know the the text message that you would get would look really um, um, uh, not fishy. Um, but they developed an, a zero click where you don't even have to click on it. And that somehow um, they are, nobody, I, as far as I know, there's no reporting in the press as to how the zero click um, uh, happens. But um, the, the Apple rushed out a patch that everyone should patch their phones, the 14.8 um update um so that's a that that's a, like so i mean i think it's actually a really fascinating question about like various type various areas of security so one role that um uh one thing one institution that plays the role of app security in the mobile space is the app stores right they really oh, do surely. play right right um, um but like there are other ways in which 
exploits come about um, that have nothing to do with like gaming or app stores. And that is because there's a revolving door between intelligence services and the private sector. So basically you have malware developers and sellers like, well, they, they work in the government and then they come out and then they use the tools and training and stuff. And then the governments protect them because they also use that malware. And so like, they, like you can it have the just Apple like the SEC and Cravath. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was, I just meant like okay. coming from like a government place of regulation and then going oh. to work for private side, like for. No, no, that's right. 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 So like, a, right. So there's like revolving doors in so many industries. And so like one huge, pro one huge problem is the fact that like, there's an enormous market. Um, there's an important market, a lucrative market um, for um, uh, ex-intelligent officers, uh, and there's nothing your app store is going to do to help you on that uh, front. That having been said, I want to ask Randy the just before we go the sixty-four thousand, that six point four trillion dollar question, <laughs> okay? Which is, do you have an Apple phone or do you have an Android phone? Yeah, so that's that's good. So um, the, I have, I, I currently have an Apple phone is the answer. So um, okay, I think yeah, I rest, I rest my case. I, I, <laughs> I have an Android phone. I, I will say, you know, now we're, now we're going to do history here. So uh, I, I, I had an original 1984 Macintosh. So um, I got that in law school. Having a home computer was so fantastic. Um, and at one point, I transitioned from the Macintosh to Windows machines. I felt a little bit of a sense of loss there, but obviously, the Macintosh market share was very small. Um, I had an Android phone. You know, I love my iPad more than I should. Um, I have an Apple Watch. I'm not. I, I, I'm not going to make this switch again. Um, okay. uh, you know, um, I like these okay. Apple devices, uh, and I guess they could piss me off at some point. But. Um, wow. Scott, you have a P. You have a PC. You have a right, don't you? you oh, yeah, a I'm, a, I'm a PC. Yeah, I, and I, I, have, I, use a, I have a Windows 10 laptop. Yeah. Just to be clear, I still do. Right, oh, right. I, I, right. I'm a, I have a Windows 10 laptop, but I use, but I do Apple um, uh, in terms of like iPad, iPhone, um, things like that. But I'm not a Gmail person. I don't want to be in the Gmail suite, um, the G suite, um, and so we all have our you know, we all have our kind of like allegiances and ecosystems that we feel comfortable buying into. But I will say one thing that I have never found antitrust as riveting as I have in the last 60 minutes. I you knew this just, was going to be so much fun. I yeah, just like, I really, uh, are, I'm really glad you came on. You right are really great. great at, all, yeah, all you I are. Wanna, I, I don't want to oversell. I want to say this is like a normal day in class. Every day in class, it's pretty interesting. I would have liked well, eight antitrust if this is what it is. <laughs> Thank you, though. I appreciate I, it. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. so great. This great is stuff. awesome. Um, okay, we will thanks be, for having me back, Kate. Yeah, of course. Anytime. <laughs> you can come whenever. And you okay. can talk about improv sometime. Yeah. Um, just let me know. Um, yeah. We will be back uh, 22 hours and 57 minutes from now uh, with a guest that I can't see because my calendar is four, three months ahead. Oh, with Tom Nichols. So Tom Nichols will be back uh, to, tomorrow. And I think he is going to be talking about his new book. So that will be uh, that will be two hours and 57 minutes from now. And it's 22 hours. Oh, um, it's the one about people being too whiny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's like, that is like, I think like the book is like everyone's too whiny. Like I think that oh, really? uh, no. I was hoping it was going to tell me how to whine better, but apparently um, not. Hold on. Is that unlikely? No, yeah. probably not. Uh, it's um, it is a uh, it is our own worst enemy. Oh, so okay. like I was really <laughs> close. <laughs> it's offered, by the way, Amazon is telling me if you like this book, you'll be you'll like surrounded by idiots, which is not by Tom, but it's by <laughs> Tom. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, so, uh, anyways, I what that was a perfect book description based on the last time Tom was on the show, and he was like, "Everyone's whiny about everything. No one's happy." Mm -hmm. he, he's, he talks about kind of the the um, 
the Adidina of of like modern life. And so that's that'll be what the book is about. And I'm excited to see him tomorrow. Uh, Randy, this was great. Um, I will talk to you soon. And um, we don't have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we do have, I guess like technically Epic is like 10 cents to the dollar of Apple. So um, yeah, no. Maybe one no, cent, no. No. One, no, cent? Ten one cent, one cent. Yeah. yeah. That's like, that oh, it's amazing. It's amazing maybe how big Apple is. Maybe that's the new little guy. That's <laughs> which, yeah, which puts it all yeah. in perspective. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs>